Hello again, everyone, and welcome to our combined Sunday School classes, the Agape class and the Young Men's Bible class from First Presbyterian Church here in Greensboro. I'm Lane Reidenhauer, and I thank you for joining us as we gather again virtually for worship and study on this, the fifth Sunday of Lent, Sunday, March 21st. Our teacher today, Sandy Gravett, will be joining us in just a few moments as she'll be continuing her series on Dreaming Big, Constructing Hope, a study of the book of Isaiah, chapter 40 through 55. It was just a year ago this weekend that we began offering a hymn each week during our Sunday School online program. Many of you had said that you missed the opportunity to sing a hymn together, and this was the easiest solution we could come up with here at the church. And so it began a new adventure for me. I had to learn how to record a hymn on the computer, which I had really never done. I had to find some pre-recorded accompaniments available online because we couldn't get together with an accompanist in person during lockdown. And also I had to choose hymns that were part of the public domain that were not copyright protected so we didn't violate any copyright laws. And the most complicated thing for me was learning how to use a video editing program. I had been involved with live production of audio and video for nearly 30 years, but I'd never done editing. So it was an opportunity to learn something new and also a good opportunity to continue serving the church. Our hymn today continues our Lenten cycle of hymns that relate to the cross. Today's hymn, The Old Rugged Cross, one of the best loved hymns of maybe our parents' generation and possibly even our grandparents' generation. It was written in 1912 by the Reverend George Bernard. He was the son of an Ohio coal miner. During his lifetime, he wrote over 300 hymns. None of them ever achieved the fame of The Old Rugged Cross. And maybe its popularity came about because of the recordings that were made by hundreds of artists through the years, and also its frequent use in evangelical campaigns throughout the United States. The text views the cross from the position of an observer, gazing in wonder and meditating upon the act of sacrifice performed there. The refrain speaks of exchanging a cross for a crown, a concept mentioned in several biblical passages. I'll put the words up on the screen for you and I'll invite you to sing along with me, The Old Rugged Cross. Exchange it 
someday for a crown. In the old rugged cross, stained with blood so divine, a wondrous beauty I see. For it was on that old cross Jesus suffered and died to pardon and sanctify me. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my troll is at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. To the old rugged cross I will be true, its shame and reproach gladly bear. Then he'll call me someday to my home far away, where his glory forever cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross and someday for a crown. The most famous of all the servant songs in Isaiah 40 to 55 shows up at the end of chapter 52 and runs through chapter 53. Its strains ring familiar in Christian ears because the writers of the New Testament saw in its words a description of Christ and Christ's work that they returned to again and again when trying to find ways to articulate their theology. Not to mention the fact that many of these phrases show up in our music and poetry as titles for artwork and the like. We have talked about this servant before. Here, however, the text appears more to read as if the writer had a specific individual in mind. That form doesn't preclude other readings that take on a more corporate tone for the servant, but it does generate no end of speculation about whether or not the prophet had a particular person firmly in mind. And I can tell you that all kinds of options have been tossed around through the ages. Is it Moses, Cyrus the Great, the deposed King Jehoiakim? Is it some leader of a small sect of the people about whom nothing historical survives, some kind of prophetic figure? Or is it meant to be read metaphorically? Is it about Zion or again about the people of Israel? We simply do not know. To sum up how frustrating that search can be, I would take you to a quote from a piece I found on a site that Luther Seminary produces. It's called Working Preacher, and it's designed to assist ministers in preparing sermons by offering short, generally sound pieces about the current lectionary passage. One entry on this servant song from April 20th of last year was written by Christopher Hayes, an associate professor of Ancient Near Eastern Studies at Fuller Theological Seminary. I want to lift one of his paragraphs because it sums up the issue well and it made me laugh. 
The two scholarly names he includes, I want to introduce you to first. They are Brevard Childs, one of the most famous American professors of Hebrew Bible who spent his career at Yale University, and S.R. or Samuel Rollins Driver. He was a professor of Hebrew and a canon of Christ Church at Oxford University, as well as a divine in the Anglican Church. Now here is what Hayes writes about this quest to say who might have been the point of reference in Isaiah 53. It is not only because of the historical possibility of identifying the original servant, but also because of the tension that is felt between the original composition and the later Christian theological application of the text that it has been deemed, quote, probably the most contested chapter in the Old Testament by Brevard Childs. Even more than a century ago, the great S.R. Driver is said to have abandoned his Isaiah commentary rather than deal with the debate. That latter sentence is truly remarkable for a Hebrew Bible scholar, and I have to give you a bit of an aside here about S.R. Driver. He was likely not only the greatest biblical scholar of the late 19th and early 20th century, but he's also one that every student of the Hebrew Bible knows today because the Hebrew lexicon is called BDB, Brown, Driver, and Briggs. And Driver was the preeminent force in putting together this resource. It is the most comprehensive cataloging and patiently teased out compendium of every word in the Hebrew Bible and where it occurs and what it means and what it derives from. And to let you know how important it is to me, I took some pictures this week of my copy that is now 35 years old and I still reference it all the time. But he also published many other books, including the 53rd chapter of Isaiah, according to Jewish interpreters, which remains the most extensive collection of manuscripts on medieval interpretation of this passage. Thus, if thinking through who this servant was frustrated S.R. Driver, it is truly a conundrum. I do not want to get lost this week in questions about the identity of the servant, especially since we can't solve them. Nor do I want to do a verse-by-verse -verse explication of this whole servant song. Instead, I want to focus on a phrase that has long captured my imagination and to think about what that phrase can teach us as we move in Lent closer to Jerusalem and closer to Holy Week. The phrase comes in verse 3. And it is Ish Makovot. That best translates man of sorrows. I have been tossing this evocative phrase around in my brain for a couple of weeks now, knowing that this passage was coming. Of course, that effort had a nice side effect. It got me singing the bluegrass standard, I am a man of constant sorrow, made famous again a few years back in the movie, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? It's been in my head for days. But in order to learn from the phrase, we need to look more closely at the verse where it shows up because this phrase doesn't stand alone. There is much to help us do exegetical work and figure out its meaning there. Additionally, because I am not so interested in the question of who the man of sorrows is, but more what we learn from the text, I am going to talk about a person of sorrows to be inclusive with regard to all that we take away. The translation I am offering you here, however, is literal. I have put the new revised standard version on the left and my own translation on the right. I'm going to read the new revised standard version. He was despised and rejected by others a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity, and as one from whom others hide their faces. He was despised, and we held him of no account. Let us talk first here about the word despised. It is used twice in the verse, 
in what we would label a poetic inclusio, which is a word or phrase that opens and then shows up again near the close of a section. That inclusio is like an alert system designed to tell us that the material between the two occurrences coheres. In fact, it is sometimes called an envelope structure to highlight that everything in between fits neatly inside. This word is also notable in that it is in a participial form both times. Technically, an SR driver would appreciate this, it is a nifal passive participle. Now in Hebrew, such a participle functions primarily as an adjective. And if you look at my translation on the right, that's how I've rendered it. But as you see in the New Revised Standard Version translation, a passive participle can also express verbal action in the passive voice. That is, the person or thing described by the participle receives the action expressed by the participle itself. In this case, he was despised. But I am not going to sit on this grammar all day because there is something else to note that will give us additional interpretive insight. Both times that this phrase occurs, it is paired with something else and those pairings differ. My translation of the first paired term is lacking as opposed to the New Revised Standard Version, which goes with rejected. I prefer lacking because the Hebrew literally reads lacking men, whereas the New Revised Standard translators went, to my mind, with rejected by others, simply because that rendering is famous and familiar. It was the choice in the King James Version and it is how it is widely known in Christian circles. Who would dare, after all, make a translational choice that varies from how we know the famous oratorio in Handel's Messiah? We talk about despised and rejected, and here's the German if you want Handel's original. Well, I did vary from that, and I did so with intention, because I wanted us to look at this passage with fresh eyes. One of the questions it makes us ask is, what does lacking mean? As a translator, I see the prophet pushing an emphasis on the despised figure being alone, isolated, without anybody for support or for care. It is why I'm a bit uneasy with that rejected by others because that reading edges over into something a bit more active on the part of those others. Going with rejected feels like the point is to underscore the harshness of others, despised and rejected. I would see it as a bit less deliberate and more about not rising to our consciousness or not being something we paid attention to because we didn't see it as important to our overall perspective. When I was thinking this through, I pulled down my Jewish Publication Society Tanakh translation, and they say he was despised and shunned by men, although they note that the meaning in the Hebrew is uncertain. Now, that got me thinking in yet another direction. And that suggestion is this. Lacking men, I think, is about the consequence or the outcome of being despised as opposed to doubling down on the description of that status. Despised, thus lacking others, might get at the idea with a bit more clarity. That reading for me gets confirmed by the second pairing at the close of the verse. Despised and we did not think of him or account him or esteem him. Maybe we might say being despised meant we did not take stock of who or what the person was because that person was nothing special to us. The final idea, despised, thus we did not esteem him. 
What I see here is that this person is being presented to us as an outcast, unable to summon any degree of significance by the measures that a society uses. Despised, then, is less about a feeling and more about a status, unworthy of our attention, of our interest, or of our concern. Despise here, then, would not indicate that we feel hatred toward the individual, but rather we walk by as if there is nothing to see, much less anything to be done. What comes next is the middle three phrases, and they help us think about this question as well. A person of sufferings, knowing affliction, as if we hid our faces from him. I want to work with that last phrase first. Hiding our faces here means looking away. It's the same idea I was just talking about. It is what we do when we are reluctant or resistant to take a good look at what is right before our eyes. This phrase links directly back to the phrase just previous to it and calls to our attention the Hebrew word holy. This word occurs here and immediately following in verse 4, and it means sickness, disease, or malady. We hide our faces from the one having known sickness. That is key because that phrase is associated with a number of other bits and pieces from this longer servant song describing disease and its consequences. Among them, so marred was his appearance beyond human semblance. We accounted him stricken. He was wounded. He had bruises. He was cut off and stricken. He had been crushed with pain. He was anguished. He poured out himself to death. This amalgamation of maladies in these verses has made many commentators, ancient ones as far back as the Talmud, as well as contemporary, think of leprosy as central to the description here. That's helpful to me. We know that what we think of as leprosy now has some continuity with what we call leprosy in the modern world. But we also know that leprosy in ancient times was a broader term that likely designated a variety of skin diseases and in some cases what appeared on cloth or on the walls of houses. It was seen in the cultures that produced the Bible as in many cultures as a sign of a person's sin or whatever the equivalent of human weakness might be in another culture. It was a divine mark of punishment. It was particularly cruel because it was often not a cause of death, but rather could be painful and cause significant disfigurement and disability. And when it came to the people of Israel, leprosy was something that made you an outsider, shunned from the protection of the whole group. If you were a priest, it was the end. You were not whole, not clean, not capable of being a conduit of the holiness of God to others. The contemporary likeness I would draw was AIDS in the 1980s and early 1990s. It really took us a decade to get a solid grip on what this disease was, even though HIV was discovered two years after the first batch of cases was noted by the CDC and the first blood test for HIV was in use two years after that. But if you remember, we could not do much for HIV or for AIDS at first, and there was so much fear. When we saw pictures of people wasting away and dying, we were afraid, and the rumors started. There were all kinds of rumors. You could get AIDS from casual contact. People who were diagnosed often tried to keep it quiet because they didn't want to become community pariahs. Families were even reluctant to include a mention of this in obituaries. 
The silence was compounded because many of those who got sick and died in America were gay, and that was not something we were talking about openly in the early 1980s. It took the face of a young Ryan White, who contracted the disease when he was 13 through a blood transfusion and had to fight for his right to attend his public school, or Elizabeth Glazer, a young mother and wife of a well-known actor and director, who had contracted it while being transfused, giving birth to her daughter, Ariel, who was also positive. And it turned out that her son, Jake, who was born subsequently, also was positive. These folks and everyone on this page died, moved the needle toward tamping down some of the public hatred of people with AIDS, some of the public shunning. But we have to own that we did not want to see because to see meant to recognize and to recognize meant to acknowledge that it could be anybody. And to know that it could be anybody meant that we all had to take some responsibility for care and for concern. It moves us to the phrase, a person of sorrows. The word here on the left, makaov, appears in our text as a plural noun that derives off the verbal root ka'av on the right, which means to be in pain. That pain can be physical or mental, depending on the context. Thus, we could easily read a person of pain. There is a double-edged quality to these words. On the one hand, when we think a person of sorrows, we are thinking about a person who experiences pain. That is a person who has an intimate, direct knowledge of what it means to suffer. But on the other hand, this phrase is also about the capacity, especially when paired with knowing affliction in the next line, to empathize with others. That is, one's own experience of pain and loss and suffering can make one more capable of seeing the pain, recognizing the suffering in others. I think of the phrase, I would not wish this on my own enemy. It is our way of saying no one deserves to be in such a situation or there but for the grace of God go I, which acknowledges it could be me. When we see each other in empathy, we recognize hurts and losses and pain and isolation in others. And no matter how it got to be that way, it is not a situation where we want anyone to be. That is, it is not about blame. It is not about trying to figure out if someone deserved some of that suffering. He was driving too fast or she's made lots of bad choices. It is simply seeing what is before our eyes and connecting to it in a human way. Jesus, in fact, was a master of that skill. One of the most beautiful stories in the Gospels to me is in Mark chapter 5. Jesus is traveling around preaching and healing, and the crowds are pressing in on him on all sides. There is, however, a woman and she's been suffering from a bleeding condition for years, a condition that made her every bit as unclean as leprosy did. And after having heard of Jesus, she wanted nothing more than simply to touch him. There's a real sadness to the story. She had been shunned and shamed for long enough that she is not even willing to plead for herself. She chooses instead to act from how she experiences her reality, from being unseen. Thus she comes up behind Jesus and touches his garment. But Jesus knows. He feels her touch and he asks his disciples about it. They tell him, there are too many people around. How can we know who touched you? But Jesus isn't satisfied with that answer and he's looking around. He's not angry because when the woman recognizes that he's trying to seek her out, 
she comes forward, afraid, and kneels before him. She tells him her story. He sees her. And listen to what he says to her. He says, be sound from your scourge. That is, he is reminding her that the thing she is experiencing is not who she is. And that is healing. For many of us, however, such a stance toward the world sounds exhausting. We can, in the course of a day, encounter so much pain and sorrow. We might have a neighbor who is newly in hospice care, a grandchild struggling at home with the isolation and separation and lack of hope for a real future. We might have a friend going through a divorce. We certainly have the constant stream of noise on the TV news or the radio or in our social media feeds, and it's all negative, 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 and politicized. We might encounter the homeless person asking for our loose change. We might see a harried parent at the store struggling to balance out the grocery bill to the last penny. Or we might be recognizing in our circles a surge of people who have lost their jobs and are worried about what's next. Can we really give our attention to each and everything that comes before us? Is that what it means to be a person of sorrows? When I was doing this lesson this week, a seminary friend from years past posted a quote on Facebook. Now I can tell you that the whole quote thing here is a bit of a stretch because it's from the Talmud more or less and how the Talmud works is actually complicated. But it's a play on Micah 6 8, and I find the quote instructive on this point. It says, Do not be daunted by the enormity of the world's grief. Do justly now. Love mercy now. Walk humbly now. You are not obligated to complete the work, but neither are you free to abandon it. In short, we are not supposed to be paralyzed in the grief and sorrow of everything that is happening in this world and in our worlds. It is too much for any of us to shoulder. But can we practice being people of sorrows, both individually and collectively? Can we try to enact it? That is, can we not avert our faces and hide from the pains of others? those pains that are right in front of our eyes. We have to say that instead of perpetuating systems that leave people who are struggling alone or hold those who are stricken in some way as of no account, we must choose actively to ally ourselves with them. And that ability starts from our willingness to see within ourselves places of pain and sorrow and abandonment and loss. It starts with recognizing the weaknesses in our own communities, whatever those weaknesses may be. Because when we recognize our own vulnerabilities and susceptibility to the forces that play out in life, it helps us to be present with others in their pain because we can then begin to know where people need healing, and where change needs to happen. I find the words of Elizabeth Kubler-Ross helpful on this point. She says, The most beautiful people we have known are those who have known defeat, known suffering, known struggle, known loss, and have found their way out of the depths. These persons have an appreciation, a sensitivity, and an understanding of life that fills them with compassion, gentleness, and a deep loving concern. Beautiful people do not just happen. I would add, persons of sorrow do not just happen. And being just that is something we as servants of God are called to aspire toward. It is a long road to get there.
But as our Lenten journey continues towards Jerusalem, we know we are on our way. Thank you for your attention, and I will finish this series on Isaiah 40-55 to next week.